Tim Bosma and his wife Charlene were the picture of bliss, raising a young daughter in the quiet of the countryside. But money was tight, according to author Ann Brocklehurst, and that led Tim to sell his beloved Dodge Ram pickup. He wanted to buy a cheaper truck. It had been advertised online for a few weeks, hadn't gotten much interest at all. And then he gets a call from these guys who seem like serious prospective buyers. On a Sunday evening, the two men arrive for a test drive, but they show up late and on foot. According to investigative journalist Alex Pearson, Tim had a bad feeling right from the start. He had said right before he went out with these men, he was feeling uneasy um, while putting his daughter down. He was feeling uneasy about it because they were late. It was an odd time to be coming to look for a truck. It was later in the evening. A little after 9 o'clock, Tim kissed Charlene goodbye and said he'd be right back. An hour later, he still wasn't home. And she started phoning him and texting him and got no answers. When initially we heard that Tim Bosman had gone missing, it's like any adult who goes missing. The opinions of everybody that something must have happened. Tim must have had a drug deal or something nefarious was going on. But cops have a different feeling. They subpoenaed Tim Bosma's phone record, so it was almost immediate. When someone is reported missing, you wait 24 hours. But the police knew, I think instinctively, this was a different kind of case because it involved online ads, uh, two guys coming to look for a truck, and that he was supposed to be back and he wasn't. Meanwhile, Tim's wife Charlene makes a desperate plea aimed at the men who took her husband. I ask, and I beg, and I plead to whomever has my husband to please let him go. Please let him come home. It was just a truck. It is just a truck. You don't need him, but I do. While waiting for answers at home, Charlene gets a heart-stopping phone call. It's from Tim's phone. They must have thought he was alive. Yep. But the call is from someone who found Tim's phone while mowing the lawn in a nearby industrial area. It's a huge lead, but cops are already onto something big. Tim's phone records show that the car shoppers called on a burner phone, a seeming dead end, except when police checked the call history of the burner phone. The day before, it called another man selling a Dodge Ram pickup an ex-Israeli soldier named Igor. Igor Tumanenko, unlike Tim Bosma, was built like a truck. He was a big, big, big guy. He's the kind of guy that when you meet him, you, in, you know, in your head, you're saying, I'm not messing with that guy. Igor tells police that he remembered one man had a distinctive tattoo on his forearm, the word ambition. And it was just by, by coincidence he mentioned this tattoo and they were able to go through the records of profile and see that tattoo in the police records. And that's what led them to Dellen Millard. Dellen Millard, a spoiled rich kid no one would ever associate with a missing body. Before he was a marked man, Dellen Millard was a boy wonder, the heir to an aviation fortune who made headlines at the age of 14 when he became the first teenager to fly solo in a helicopter and an airplane on the same day. Like holding a plate on your finger, trying to keep that thing straight. Sadly, Millard's father committed suicide in 2012, right after he invested over $3 million in this new airport hangar. And Millard was never very keen on this business idea. And within a matter of days after his father died, he canceled all the licenses, all the permits, all the certification required to work on aircrafts. So here's Dallin Millard, who's got all the money in the world, thanks to daddy. And instead of you know, using what he had to make something for himself and continue this aviation dynasty that the Millard family had. He's out there partying like a rock star, doing a lot of drugs and, and hanging around nefarious people and stealing stuff. 
Millard always surrounded himself with people who were younger than him, four or five years, and he was the leader. He paid for everything, so he gained a certain amount of control and status by bankrolling these younger friends. One of those groupies was this man, Mark Smitch, a wannabe rapper. It's like a freestyle session with no lesson, no question. I'm killing you in possession. Smitch was going to be a rap star, and I guess Millard saw himself as maybe the producer, the manager. Who's who? Blues clues. Tell the cops anything, and then you die on the news. This is a guy who met his dream of all dreams, a rich guy he could do drugs with, steal cars with, hang around and play video games with. But it escalated for Mark Smitch. Millard and Smitch and a group of friends went on what they called missions. And the mission was to steal things. And police say Millard was using the hangar for anything but aircraft. What was going on inside that hangar? What kind of business did he have? There was no planes. So for an airplane hangar, this thing was not doing what it was supposed to be used for, which was storing planes and servicing planes. No, this thing was a full-blown chop shop. These guys were out stealing anything they could get their hands on. They were stealing a lot of construction equipment, bringing it in, stripping it down, selling it for parts. Five days after Tim Bosma went missing, cops tracked Millard to a bank where he spotted withdrawing three grand. Minutes later, he's arrested. They find the keys to Bosma's truck in his possession. But for now, he's only charged with unlawful detention. What police really want to know is, where's the truck? And the bigger question, where is Tim Bosma? Charlene Bosma, whose husband Tim has been missing since he took two strangers on a test drive, just got hopeful news. Police arrest a suspect, Dellen Millard, a millionaire bad boy, and he's got the keys to Tim's truck in his pocket when cops grab him. And cops believe Millard might also hold the key to unlock the mystery of a missing young woman, his former girlfriend, Laura Babcock. But first, they have to solve the case of Tim Bosma. Due to the unusual nature of this disappearance, the homicide unit will now take the lead. Millard isn't talking, and using surveillance video, police are piecing together a very different ending to this story. This video from a neighboring business shows Bosma's truck driving past shortly after Tim left his house. Police believe that's Dellen Millard behind the wheel. His sidekick, Mark Smitch, in the back, and in the passenger seat, Tim Bosma. But remember how Tim's cell phone was found in a nearby industrial park? Video from that location shows two vehicles arriving at the scene. Police experts say this one with the running lights on top is Tim's. The one trailing is Millard's SUV. Bosma's phone was found about 300 yards from this very spot. And then there's video from the Millard airplane hangar. The same two vehicles drive up about two hours later. But this time, Bosma's truck is towing a large piece of equipment. Footage from inside the hangar shows the two men arriving, Smitch on the left, Millard on the right. Moments later, a bright flame can be seen erupting from outside the hangar. It would burn all night. Mark Smitch and Della Millard are not smart guys. I mean, these are two of the stupidest people uh, on earth. They took this truck and put it in his hangar. And they told their employees, don't come in. But then the employees start showing up the next day to the hangar and there's this black truck. That's all over the news. After Millard is arrested, police search the hangar but can't find the truck. Again, surveillance video tells the tale. Two days after Tim went missing, Millard's red pickup is seen here towing a large fifth wheel trailer from the hangar. You can probably guess what's inside. Of all the places to hide the truck, where did they decide to hide this truck? Mommy Dearest. Mommy Dearest's house had this truck. Thanks to a tip from neighbors, cops search the trailer and find Tim's truck concealed inside. It confirms their grim suspicions. Despite the fact that the two front seats have been stripped out, police find a 38 caliber shell casing in the back seat. 
Dellen Millard's fingerprints, and bloodstains from Tim Bosma. Infrared luminal examination reveals even more blood, which was hastily washed away. Plus, a 38 caliber pistol is found in a toolbox owned by Millard. In some ways, it, they seem like they were very dumb about how they covered up their tracks. Dumb does not begin to explain Mark Smitch and Della Millard. Or maybe it was that Della Millard was so drunk on his own narcissism that he felt he would never be caught. A search of Millard's property turns up the most disturbing evidence yet. Hidden in the woods, police find the Eliminator, an industrial incinerator that burns up to a scorching 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's riding atop a trailer Millard had specially built to make it mobile. This huge, hulking piece of equipment used to incinerate cows, horses, huge livestock. That's what it's meant for. Did he have any livestock? No, he didn't have any pets, except for a dog named Petto. Police believe this was the heavy equipment being towed that night to the hangar, and also the source of the flame seen burning white hot for several hours. A forensic pathologist combs the inside of the eliminator, finding bone fragments, a tooth, and a blood stain on the outside matching 32-year-old Tim Bosma. This woman got into the incinerator. She had the police buy her a little handheld vacuum cleaner so she could get every last bit of Tim's remains and give them to the family. Police quickly arrest Millard's partner in crime, Mark Smitch, and charge both men with murder. But during the trial, Smitch turned snitch. So what was their defense? He did it. Mark Smitch very quickly pointed out that he was just in it to steal a truck, didn't know anything about killing anybody, and then all of a sudden, Della Millard pulled out a gun and shot the guy, and he was so scared, he just went along for the ride to help burn the body, cover up the crime, which is just an absolute load of <laughs> He was in it, he did it, he partook in it, and he got caught. According to prosecutors throughout the trial, Millard wrote letters begging his girlfriend to lie in his defense. He's like, I love you, we're gonna have babies, we're gonna travel the world, but by the way, can you tell, you know, Andrew uh, and all our friends, can you tell them not to say that, or can you tell them to, to change the story, or it didn't happen like that, okay, love you. In, in one, he suggests that Smitch and two of his friends actually went to on the test drive that Millard wasn't there at all and the letters say destroy this letter all over them after you've read it but she very helpfully put them in the bedside table so that when the police arrested her they found them. We may never know which man actually pulled the trigger but the jury is convinced that Millard and Smitch are guilty. They're sentenced to life behind bars. But according to Ann Brocklehurst, who literally wrote the book on this horrific murder, the questions don't end there. And just when you think something stranger couldn't happen, it does. Laura Babcock, a young woman struggling with drug and mental health issues, has been missing for over five years. Laura Babcock simply vanished into thin air. Police say her last known contact was with none other than Dellen Millard. And get this, he bought the Eliminator shortly before she vanished. Do the police have any idea what happened to her? Police sources told the Hamilton Spectator that they believed that Laura was incinerated. And that's what prosecutors believe. Even without a body, they put Millard and Smitch on trial for Laura's murder. Ann Brocklehurst spoke to us via Skype after the dramatic trial. Millard was acting as his own lawyer. First witness was Laura's father, and Millard cross-examined him. He asked Laura's father if he was an abusive parent. There was absolutely no evidence of that. After five days of deliberation, the jury found both men guilty of first-degree murder. But the case against Dellen Millard isn't over. Millard's father supposedly committed suicide by shooting himself shortly before his son turned the family air hanger 
into a chop shop party house. The illegal gun he used was traced back to this man, a notorious gun dealer and police say associate of Dellen Millard. Wayne Millard's death was originally classified as a suicide. But when the investigation was reopened, the police said, no, we were wrong and reclassified it as a murder. Could the alleged motive be money? Millard inherited his father's empire after his death. I think this case, when it's all said and done and the story's all told, Dellen Millard, I think, will go down one of the most prolific serial killers in Canadian history. But in this madness, it's easy to lose sight of Tim Bosma's tragic and senseless death. I mean, people came to feel like they knew or were connected to, in some way, this family who were a great young family. Della Millard could afford 50 trucks. He could have gone out and bought any truck that he wanted. I think the headline really is about Tim Bosma, not Della Millard. Tim Bosma was everything right in life. He was what everyone aspires their child to be. And he got wiped out for a truck.